You may find this somewhat difficult to believe, but many, many years ago, when I was uh, at Bible college, I was a somewhat passionate and rather blunt person when it came to expressing my views on theology and the scripture and so on and so forth. I know, that's quite shocking. Uh, and anyway, back during that period of time, we, I was doing a subject and the lecturer said that we could pick our own topic for the major assignment. And, uh, and I was very, very excited about this opportunity. And so I chose the somewhat lofty title of The Changing Nature of Evangelicalism from Doctrinal to Pragmatic Concerns. Uh, and so basically what I want to do is look how people used to be uh, excited about doctrine and theology, but then the church had moved to being more worried about pragmatically doing things. So what would be successful in terms of practice rather than what was honouring to the Scriptures? This uh, particular assignment that I did uh, caused such a furor when submitted, the lecturer gave me a distinction and the moderator failed it. Uh, how's that for a disparity? Uh, anyway, it then went on to blow up. It went around uh, the theological circles of Australia and it caused all of the students in my Bible college to get one mark dropped off their results, something I have somewhat infamy for, um, as part of the outworking of all of the shenanigans. The critical question is, why? Why did this assignment from a fairly ordinary student cause such a furor? The reality is, it just happened to drop right into the middle of a genuine problem that was going on in the church. And so it happened to critique an actual issue that was alive in the life of the church. Well, what I'm going to do to you this morning is just read you a slight excerpt from the assignment. There you go. So I have never done this before, but here we go. George Barner, commenting on countless studies by his research group, concluded that for many millions of Americans... God exists for the pleasure of humankind. He resides in heaven, waiting for our benefit. In a further study led by Christian Smith from Notre Dame University on American teenage spirituality, it was found that the dominant form of religion or spirituality today is moralistic, therapeutic deism. Moralistic Therapeutic deism. What does that mean? It means this. God made the world. He wants us to be nice to one another. And the goal of life is to feel good about yourself. So the dominant form of Christianity in America is God made everything. He wants you to be nice and he wants to be a benefit to you. Moralistic, therapeutic deism. My assignment goes on, what passes now as the evangelical church is little more than life coaching that is offered in a variety of secular professions and other religions. With feeling good about yourself, the goal of many people's religion, churches have been drawn into competing to do exactly that, make people feel good about themselves. Many churches now realize they are in a marketing movement and, the, um, and that they need to compete for their share of the market. If people are not happy with how they are made to feel, they will make another choice. Unfortunately, I think it's now truer of the church today than when I wrote it all those years ago. That the idea of moralistic, therapeutic deism still governs much of the church today. The reality is, if we come to Jesus to feel better about ourselves if we come to Jesus because we think that's how we should appear or that that will appeal to people around us, then we're not coming to Jesus for the right reasons. The person who believes in Jesus, they intellectually affirm his existence, they put a Jesus fish sticker on their car, and yet they don't know him, has been the topic of our passage over the last couple of weeks. This is what Matt showed us that you were encouraged to get online and listen to by 
Drew. He showed us last week that people believed in Jesus because of the signs he was doing, because of the public miracles he was doing, but the passage said that Jesus would not entrust himself to them because he knew their heart. And what was their heart? Their heart was moralistic therapeutic deism. Their heart was actually for themselves and not for Christ. That's what he knew about them. They wanted something of the miracles of Jesus, the power of Jesus, the popularity of Jesus, but they, what they wanted was actually for themselves and not for the glory of Jesus. So the pivotal question, the one we have to answer is, what do we do to make sure that that's not us? that Jesus isn't entrusting himself to. You know. You know the truth as you sit here this morning. If you come to church and your heart says, I like church, but the people here who carry on about Jesus all of the time is really just a bit much, then you don't actually know him. If you constantly justify to yourself why you don't serve, why you don't tithe, why you don't come to church regularly, why you don't want to forgive someone, why you don't care about someone, then you seem to have a big problem. Well, this week the text flows on from last week and it gives us an example of the person that Jesus doesn't entrust himself to. Two, but it also gives us the answer on how we need to change. And that is the important thing for us this morning. An example of who he doesn't entrust himself to and how we need to change. So if you have your Bible there, let's open up to John chapter 3. And we're going to read from verses 1 to 8 from God's Word. John chapter 3, 1 to 8. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, You must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. And you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it, is, or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Amen. So we have Nicodemus, and he's going to come into our journey through the Gospel of John again. So he's going to crop up. We're going to get to know this guy, Nicodemus, a little more as we work through the Gospel of John. Uh, now, a little bit of re a refresher. Now, remember, who are the Pharisees? The Pharisees control the synagogues. They are religious rulers who are very, very hung up on obeying the law. The, the Sadducees control the temple. They are the Levites and priests, and they dominate the temple. Out of the Pharisees and the um, Sadducees, they have a council of 70 rulers over the whole of the Jewish people, and that is called the Sanhedrin. So the Sanhedrin, mixture of Pharisees and Sadducees, and the effective rulers over the Jews. Not over the Roman Empire, of course, over the Jewish people. Nicodemus is a, um, of the Sanhedrin. So he's an important guy. He's one of the 70, one of the ruling members over the Jewish people. He's a powerful, wealthy man with serious clout among the Jewish people. 
and he comes to Jesus by night. Now, we have to be careful here. I don't know whether you've heard this before, but some people immediately want to jump and say, the reason that he came by night is because he was scared that people might see him talking to Jesus. And I don't think that's accurate. I think he came by night, firstly, because it was night time. Right? So I think that's probably the first logical explanation. But why would John include that he comes at night specifically? Well, we have to take everything in its kind of context. And John is writing his gospel to a theme. Is he not, regular attenders? I've kind of mentioned that a few times. Uh, So everything we read in John, it's true, but he's writing to a theme. And this word night, throughout John, it's used seven or eight times. Every time it has something in common. It is linked to spiritual darkness. So every time he mentions it, it is linked to spiritual darkness. For instance, if we look at Judas Iscariot, he betrays Jesus at night. A man who's going out and not working, uh, who's working in the wrong way, uh, Jesus says if he works at night, he stumbles. The, uh, the disciples are out trying to catch fish and they're not catching anything at night. There's always a significant absence of the power of God, of the light of God. And whenever John uses this term, he's making a point. Right here, right now, there's an absence of the light of God at work. So what is he saying? He's saying that Nicodemus, this leader over Israel, a member of the Sanhedrin, a leader of leaders, as it were, he comes to Jesus and he comes as one who is still dark in his soul. So was it nighttime? Yeah, I think it was. But he makes the point to say that Nicodemus has yet, hasn't yet embraced the light of God found in Jesus Christ. He comes in darkness. In the previous few verses, John has told us that there are those who believe, which Matt looked at last week, those who believe because of the signs, and Jesus did not entrust himself to them. And now, if you noted in our passage, it begins... This man came to Jesus by night, said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher, come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. A understanding based around the signs of God, but not an actual faith in Jesus. When I was, uh, I don't know, I think it was 2004, I was in uh, the southern part of Bulgaria leading a mission team uh, into the poorer quarter, quarter and slums in southern Bulgaria. And uh, when I was there, uh, I was there roughly 10 years after there had been this incredible move of God among this uh, specific people group who had never really had a church before in Bulgaria. So there's about four main people groups, and this group was pretty devoid of the gospel. And God had moved in power in the mid-90s. And when I say God had moved in power to establish his church, the stories were just amazing. It was regular that people were getting healed from all kinds of diseases and sicknesses. Uh, You had uh, people who'd been confined to wheelchairs for their entire life who were walking. Uh, The dead were being raised. A non-existent church in a matter of a couple of years went to a 300,000 strong church in a very short space of time, a few years. The power of God moved through there in incredible signs and it had this huge and incredible impact. So I was there 10 years later, 2005. Many of those same churches were now empty. From 300,000 plus believers, there were now under 150,000 believers. Why? Why would the church 
shrink so rapidly in such a short amount of time? Because when the church moved from signs to faithfulness, those who were only there for themselves quickly moved on to look for the next sign, the next wonder, the next thing that would benefit them. What was left were those who had truly given themselves to Jesus and were there for the long haul. The truth is it's not a picnic following Christ. It's not meant to be. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you also. Why? Why would Jesus say that? Because we don't follow the, the world's standards. We follow Jesus' standards. He is our Lord and our Master. He is not like the world of sin. And so when we follow Him, it brings us into conflict with the world. The same way that Jesus was in conflict with the world, if we follow Jesus, we end up in conflict with the world. I watched a news report on Thursday. It was of an old pastor in his 70s. And he was, I saw him getting arrested by police, roughed up by two police officers and even kicked at one stage. What was this old pastor in his 70s doing? He was standing on a box in England, in London, and he was reading from the Bible that marriage is between a man and a woman. Someone reported it as hate speech, and the cops turn up and grabbed this old fella and dealt with him incredibly roughly. Honouring God and his word brings you into conflict with the world who just doesn't follow him. What's interesting to me, though, is we can sometimes see that story and we can read about that story and we feel this real anger, we feel this real, like, that is so wrong, and yet the apostles probably would have said about that old man, praise God, you were counted worthy to suffer for his name. If we open our Bibles to Acts 5, 40 to 42, this is what it says, Acts 5, 40 to 42. When the, the court had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus, <laughs> good luck, not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. Amen? Right? How's that for a different reaction? They beat them and don't talk about Jesus anymore. And they walked out of there going, praise God, we were counted worthy to suffer for him. And now let's go and tell everyone about him. But that's the God of the scriptures. That's the faith that we are called to live. And praise God that this old fella in his 70s was counted worthy to suffer for the name. I guarantee you, he is not sad right now. He's rejoicing and praying for those cops who probably mishandled him, right? Because we're called to honour Christ. So what's the difference between Nicodemus coming in his spiritual darkness, between the people in the previous week that Jesus won't entrust himself to, What's the difference between them and the apostles? How do we know? How do we know that we can live differently? How do we know that Jesus will entrust himself to us? And Jesus gives us the answer right there in verse 3 of our passage, didn't he? Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Another quick refresher. The ancients didn't 
underline or bold things. If they wanted to highlight something, if they wanted to make an exclamation mark, they repeated it. So when he says, truly, truly, or verily, verily, or whatever your translation says, that double repetition means, listen up. This is very important. That's what that says. So listen up. I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Being born again is what makes the difference between unsaving belief and saving belief. You cannot make it any clearer than that. Who will Jesus entrust himself to? Those who are born again. It's that clear. That is the answer of the question that was posed last week, and it's the answer to the question that Nicodemus poses in this passage. How do we know we are saved? How do we know that Jesus will entrust himself to us? Are you or are you not born again? And that is the question that you need to ask yourself. Now, Nicodemus, he doesn't get it because he's come in the darkness of his soul. Don't you love his response? Can a man enter his mother, mother's womb again and be born again? And the answer is no, much to the delight of every woman in this room, right? Um, so, you know, can a man be born again? No. So what does Jesus mean? He says, unless one is born of the water and of the Spirit. Now, what does he mean by unless one is born of the water? You remember, we're always going to look at everything in context. And they understood here, and he's talking to Nicodemus, they understood baptism. And Nicodemus understood baptism. John was currently baptizing people in their thousands. And what was the baptism of water? It was a baptism of repentance. The word repentance means to turn away from. So the, the visual representation is you're walking this way and you live a certain way. So I chase my lusts and I chase my passions and I chase my wealth and I chase all of these things. And repent means I completely turn around and I no longer chase those things because now I'm chasing Jesus and I'm chasing, chasing holiness and I'm chasing uh, God, all of those things. So that's what repentance means. And Jesus says you must be born of water. So you must repent. You must change. You've got to stop your life of sin and start honoring Jesus. But the thing about repentance is it's a human act of the will. I decide now to change the way I live. I'm not going to do this anymore and I'm going to start doing this. It's a baptism of repentance. And Nicodemus understood that and the Pharisees understood that. John's baptism was Everyone, know this, you are a sinner and you need to stop living the way you live. But there's a problem. How many of us, by our sheer human will, can turn away from every sin in our life and live perfectly? No one. No one. No one can do that 100%. Should we do it? Yes. Can we do it to reach God's standard? No. No, you must be born of the water and of the Spirit. You have to have a baptism, in a sense, by man, and you have to have a baptism by God, His work in your life, His will in your life, His bringing you to Himself. The Bible says that when our parents, Adam and Eve, rebelled against God, we died spiritually. And now each of us, we are born, we live, we die, but we are dead spiritually. We cannot please God. We cannot be with God. We must be born again. 
The great problem for everyone is this. You can try and change your behavior. You can try and be a better parent. You can try and be a better husband or wife. You can come to church regularly. You cannot get drunk. You can be a good friend to people. And all of it is being born of water. It is good. It is needed. But it's not enough. You must be born again. So what does it mean? How are we born again? What does that actually break down to? And I'm just going to take you to a verse. It's Galatians 2.20. If you want to know what it means to be born again, Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. I have died with Christ is what that means. That when I came to Jesus, my life was nailed to the cross in him and I died with him to the world and its desires. I have been crucified with Christ. That which was Sam, his dreams and goals of being a wonderful rugby league player, his dreams and goals of being popular, his dreams and goals of all of those things needed to Die, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's what it means to be born again. This life in this flesh, the dreams, hopes, and desires that you have had, they died You gave up this worldly life. Your desires, your comforts, the applause of people, the comfort of money, the appearance of goodness, you gave it all up and then you rose again. You were born again to a new life in Jesus. What is the applause of man against the approval of Christ? What is the satisfaction of wealth against the security of Christ? What is the facade of goodness against the gift of righteousness in Christ? See, we die to all of those other things because we have Jesus and he is enough. He fulfills every longing. He fulfills every desire. He is enough. The belief that leads to salvation is the belief that incorporates a funeral. Your own. You must die to this life and its desires and be born again to a life in Jesus and his desires. That's what it means to be born again. When we are born again, then we begin to live a life that is different from the world for we are no longer of the world. We died to it. So the challenge of the scripture is, have you? Have you been born again into the kingdom of heaven? Have your goals and desires changed or are they unrecognizable from the world? Have your goals, desires, dreams, hopes, changed or they unrecognizable from the world if you're born again to new life in Christ then you will look very different from the world and everything it cherishes Jesus continues to explain and he says that which is flesh is flesh and that which is spirit is spirit The flesh means the world and its desires. Our allegiance to all of that rubbish. Our addiction to social media. Gossip. Judging others while giving ourselves a tick of approval. The flesh has no place in the kingdom of God. Only what is spirit, the new life in Jesus, has any place in the kingdom of God. 
That which is flesh is flesh and it's dead. Only what is born again into the life of the Spirit has a place with God. You can come to church your entire life and not be born again. Because you can come to church your entire life and not be crucified with Christ and die to the world and its desires. Church cannot save you. Being nice to one another cannot save you. Only death to the world and its desires and new life in Jesus, born again, will save you. That is what Christ is saying to Nicodemus. And it becomes really, really clear. And that's what Jesus drives home and towards the end of this passage when he talks about the wind blowing, if you uh, remember that at the end there. The Hebrew word ruach and the Greek word pneuma can mean either breath or wind or spirit. That's what makes this passage interesting, but it's, it's really a play on words that's going on here because in Greek, when it's all the one word, he's giving us this little play on word between the wind and the Spirit of God, or in, on real essence, what he's talking about is the effect of the wind and the effect of the Spirit of God, right? That's why he's talking about here at the end, and what is his point? Why is, what's that got to do with this passage? The point is that the wind cannot be controlled or understood by us as regular people. You know, most of you know that I'm a spear fisherman. We've had these big northerlies blowing recently. I tried to have a spear the other day. I went four miles offshore to try and find clean water. I swam down a few meters trying to get under the murky water. I still couldn't see the end of my gun. It's a tragedy because I can't control the wind. Once it turns to the westerlies, oh, the water will clear up. Beautiful. Right? We can't control it, can we? It'd be fun if we could, because we'd all be competing against each other for different reasons, you know? I'd want it from the West, somebody else would be like, nah, give us a southerly, somebody, right? We can't control it, and that's the point. But what we can see is its effect. It can make the water murky. It can blow the trees around. In a violent storm, it can actually be dangerous and threatening. Right? We can't see the wind. We can see what the wind does. We can't control the wind. It can be a gentle breeze and it can be damaging and destructive, but we just have to kind of ride with whatever it is the wind is doing. And, and John is saying the Spirit is like that. We can't see the Spirit. We can't control the Spirit, but His effects are undeniable and unmistakable. What is he saying in the context of the passage? He's saying everyone who is born of the Spirit can neither be controlled nor understood by the person of one birth. That's what the passage is saying. Everyone who is born of the Spirit, they have their origin and destiny now in God, not in human decision, not by the will of a husband over his family, not by an employer or a boss. No, they have now given themselves over to the Spirit of God, and it means that from the eyes of a human world, they are now outside of its control. You can't see what's controlling them, but they are now under the lordship and authority of God, you can see its impact though. How do you see the impact? Because you meet a Christian who is following the lordship of Jesus, who is born again of the Spirit, and they go to work and they say, you know what, thank you for that offer of promotion, but it's going to be so busy, I've got no time left to serve in my church, so no thank you. And the person born of one birth, the person of the flesh says, are you an idiot? 
I'm offering you a great job here, more money. And you say no because you want to serve in your church? Grow up. Right? You can't understand or control the person who has given their life over to the Spirit of God, can you? I've known a doctor who quit his job to go and be a faith missionary overseas from a really healthy amount of money to virtually no money, depending every day that the Lord would provide what they need to get through another day. And everyone in the world goes, gee, I think that was a really good decision for your future. No. They say, you've lost your mind. Jesus says, no, they've been born again. And the life they now live, they live in the Spirit of God. They live in Christ, in His Lordship. So they no longer ask the question, what's good for my super? Can I provide everything I need for my family? Their first question is this, Jesus, what would you have me do? Because they've been born again into his lordship and authority. So Jesus says to Nicodemus, you can't control this, my friend. You want it all to be in a box. Tick this box, tick that box. Do this thing, don't do that thing, and then I'll be okay with God. And Jesus says, no, you need to die, Nicodemus. You need to be born again into the new life of the Spirit where he's in control and you have no idea what God's going to do with your life. And you have to trust him, and that's how you honor God. Everyone know the story of the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus? Jesus says, give it all away and follow me. Be born again. Let the Spirit control your life. And he walks away sad because he was very rich. Church, here's the challenge in closing this morning. Have you been born again? I don't care if you've grown up in church. I don't care if you're a 20th generation church attender. Have you been born again? Do you know what it's like to die to the world and its desires? to put your trust in the death, of the death and resurrection of Jesus and to rise with him into the newness of life with his lordship. And that means that from that day on, you are uncontrollable in the eyes of the world because your one question is, Lord, what would you have me do? If it serve in the same grind of a tough job for 50 years to be a witness for Jesus in that boring place, then I will do it, Lord, because you speak, you're in control, and that's what you would have me do. Amen? And if you want me to go serve on the mission field and suffer for your name, when they say no longer preach the gospel, I will say, you're kidding, right? And I will tell people all the more of Jesus, Lord, if that's what you want me to do, then sign me up, I'm in. Because I'm dead to the world and its desires, the Spirit controls me and I follow where He leads and not where the world says is smart or comfortable. That's what it means to be born again. Church, if you don't know that, if you look at your life and you make your decisions based around worldly principles, then know this. You can get down on your knee and you can surrender all of those things to God. Die to them, give them up, hand them over to him. Ask Jesus to take your life. Take it over, take control, give it to him. Accept life in his name and wherever that may lead. Know the reckless, crazy joy of the spirit controlling your life. It could end up in Doomagy, right? Because when you're growing up as a kid, you're like, the one place I want to go in my life is go and live in Doomagy. No, you end up there because the Spirit leads you. Or you end up in a slum in Bulgaria talking to people about Jesus. Or like I said, you end up in a nine to five because there are workmates there who need to hear the gospel. But whatever you do, 
It's Christ first and his will that matters. Church, there's such joy in being born again. Don't settle for religion. Come to Christ and know the satisfaction, joy and promise of life with him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's so clear that you lived the life that we can't. You lived the perfect life, that you died to pay the penalty of our sin. Lord, that when we give our life to you, we are born again into your resurrected life. We are included in you. Eternal life is guaranteed. But first, there has to be that funeral, that death of our life, our worldly life. Lord, for anyone here this morning who is not born again, I just pray, reveal that to them. Lord, may they surrender this life, turn away from this life, give up this life, and put their faith in you alone. Know the joy of guaranteed salvation. And know the reckless kind of crazy joy of the Spirit blowing us where he will, with our only question being, Lord, use me. Use me for your glory. Lord, I pray that everyone here would put their complete and utter faith in you. And I ask this in your precious name. Amen.